welcome everyone. So spring is here, September monthly members meeting. We have a little bit to go through here. So let's get into it. Uh, so this is just a bit of a content page of what we've got. So let's just dive in. Um, this is a prototype uh, that Miles Whitaker is working on at the moment, and it's um, a dashboard showing our members at the moment. So as you can see, uh, we've met the requirements for the AEC to stay registered. Now we're just waiting for that, um, that audit to be complete. So when this is launched, you can always access yourself here too. Um, so yeah, real quickly through the uh, loss. Um, so there have been actually a couple of adjustments over the last ones um, where what we're already seeing in the balance sheet, but um, there's a couple of small um, sort of adjustments to some of our numbers. But yeah, this month has been relatively uh, straightforward, so nothing really outstanding. Um, we've got a slight positive um, sort of accounts of this, which is nice. Um, this doesn't really factor in sort of amortized expenses for later, things that will be more expensive later. So but ideally, on these kinds of months, we always want to make sure we're making a bit of a profit here. Um, so that we've got the money for those other things. Um, so just on the balance sheet, uh, with sort of um, the, the sort of the amounts in the bank, plus just some small, um, just some current sort of ongoing sort of ins and outs that are uh, in the in the uh, in the in, in, currently being processed. Um, the sorry, it's been a very long day. Um, that's we're we're sitting at about three thousand two hundred and eighty six. So we're a, a, a bit higher than we were a last um, sort of couple of months after the sort of the big expenses, and so we're building those coffers back up again. Uh, so that's looking good. So as always, thanks to everyone who's uh, been donating through the month. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so so this doesn't become like a, a lecture or a boring work meeting or whatever. Um, any questions, any thoughts, anyone, because this is really where we want people to, to interact with us and feel part of the party. Yeah, and like the, um, like uh, Saha brought up about the stuff that Miles is doing, we'll be looking at maybe taking these things out of the monthly membership meeting and making them just more readily available on the website. So um, so hopefully that makes things a little bit uh, better. We can spend more time here having discussions and talking about other things. Yeah, having a chat. Um, and yeah, this is all because of transparency. So you'll be able to see all our finances and members on the website soon. All right, so executive reports. So um, just reminding everyone that we do have our exec meetings every fortnight. So that's where we get together and we tally and, and decide our decisions. And it's open to all members for observation. So if you're interested, please send us an email to exec at fusionparty.org.au. The next meeting is September 14th. Um, we will be having an AGM soon. So this will be our second AGM, Fusion Terms 2, and that will be Sunday, November 5th, we're aiming for. Um, and so what the AGM will allow is it will allow um, people to propose amendments to our party constitution. So the constitution you can find on our website. If you have anything you'd like to, to add to the AGM agenda, for the constitution, um, you have up until 28 days before the AGM. So the deadline would be um, October, early October. Um, and then this is also an opportunity to put yourself up for nomination to be elected into the executive. So we'll have um, the executive roles are president, convener, um, registered officer, treasurer, secretary, all of those. So when we release information in the next few days, have a read through and really think about it. Um, also wanted to talk about um, our commitment to integrity, accountability and transparency, and we're developing a framework. And you'll see more of what this is about as we approach the AGM. So just stay tuned on that. And any questions, please feel free to ask. And yeah, our, our contact is just at the bottom there. Any questions? Does anyone? Um, yeah, just far away. I don't want our party to seem too, uh, you know, obfuscated, you know. It's all about just ask us things. Uh, Steve, and you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking my question. Um, just something I was thinking about, not about this particular slide, but the one before. Just wondering, uh, uh, sorry, the couple before. Just wondering what, uh, now that we've got, the number that we need for electoral roll, et cetera. 
what's the next goal? Do we do we have now another goal for how many members we want or um, where, where to go from here for, for the membership? Yep, in the background, we're developing a, a strategy. So we'll have those numbers clarified. But yeah, I mean, we want to just grow as much as we can, but we need a very clear plan to engage with our local communities and get people on board. Um, and, and that really requires us refining and articulating our message and what we're about so people can connect with us in the first place. So yeah, we definitely wanna grow. Um, I don't think we have like a specific number in mind. It's just, it's more like endless growth is the ideal. Yep, cool. Um, any other questions? If I can join on that just real quickly, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Miles Whitaker, who's uh, been, I'm sure Miles would have a lot to say on this if he was able to make it today, he was sort of his an apology for tonight. Uh, but yeah, he's he's been working a lot on that as well. I think he's, some of the things I've heard him say is um, the, there are definitely going to be efforts to do sort of continuous drives, uh, continuous member drives. Um, and and yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea is to have a sort of a holistic strategy going forward that where we kind of sort of build it where we're building up on lots of bases and the just meeting that those AEC totals is good um but the it's still we still want to get beyond that to to make ourselves more secure on those fronts fantastic okay committee reports so we have three committees engagement committee comms committee and policy so I chair engagement um comms is with Angus and policy is with Michael um, so just wanted to highlight that we have an events calendar that you can all uh, get onto your Google app on your phone so you can really see upcoming fusion events without needing to look through your emails for the Zoom links or anything like that. We also have um, fusionparty.org.au slash events is where we put our events for future reference. State-based coordinators. So this is part of our expansion and what we'll be doing is um, calling out to recruit people who could be interested to start to organize events for their state. So we really want to have more on the ground social engagement kind of events. Zoom, everyone's sick of it. We want to see faces again. We want to have chats in the pub or the cafe. So if that tickles your fancy, please send us an email. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking. We'll be reaching out to people anyway about that. Um, Miles is running the September monthly volunteer induction. So the details for that are on the slash events page. So if you're really interested to get further involved, please attend. Um, and then as well, we have a new member profile podcast. So at the moment, you would have seen Chris Juba's episode that came out with the newsletter. Ron Dagan also um, has an episode that's just come out, but I'll advertise that in the next monthly newsletter. But feel free to have a listen and if you are inspired to share more about who you are and how you led, how, how it led you to come to Fusion, we would really love to share that with the rest of the world because I think it really helps to uh, communicate what Fusion is about and humanize and personalize us as a community. I think we need more of that. Over to comms. Angus, are you okay? Yep, yeah, I'm all good, sorry. Just getting away for a moment. So for comms, we've got our newsletter contributions. So anything you'd like to see in our newsletter or what you think we might be missing, just email us at comms at Fusion and we can add that in because we'd love to hear all your feedback and what we can do better. And then we've also got our monthly meeting pitch form, which is quite new. I think that went out in an email. Uh, was it in the last newsletter as well? Yeah. Cool. Any questions so far? I know we've already gone through quite a bit, but if not, we'll go to policy. As you always, yeah, the normal stuff is sort of the policy. We have a policy intake form, which is where you can send through uh, sort of policy suggestions or things that you think we need to be addressing. Um, it's one that we have been trying to get better at sort of responding to or, or, or starting working work streams from those things. So uh, if you have sent something to and you haven't heard from us yet, just to sort of stay tuned, we will get to you. Um, and and yeah, always, as always, just 
it's, um, we definitely need more hands on deck and more people contributing as, as much as possible. We want to make sure we hear from everyone. Um, usually we have a fortnightly policy development meeting on Wednesdays where we've been primarily focusing on housing. Uh, clashes with this one, so we will be looking at continuing this one at the end of, um, sort of after this one concludes. Um, now, just quickly, um, for, before we do further policy stuff, um, we have uh, Bryony to speak to about the Climate Accord. This was brought up, so I believe, last uh, meeting, um, which was more of a watch this space. And I think Bryony has some, uh, is able to provide some more updates to that. Yep, so the, the Climate Rescue Accord is cross, a cross-party initiative. So four federally registered parties have been working together on this and we call ourselves the working group. And when I say registered parties, there's three of us have represent, you know, uh, endorsed representatives from three parties and then there's someone else from another party and he's just working with us and they're, they're just watching the space and they'll see, you know, whether they endorse it or not. Uh, but it's really just a, a broad platform and where, what the gap has been in all the climate policies out there is that there's no actual, no one's putting on the table a solution to restore a safe climate. If we went to zero emissions today, we would, we might still roll into hothouse earth. That's how bad it is. Even if, you know, there's, in addition to that, there's all the drawdown we need to do, but then there's still a gap. The drawdown, if we could do it, is still, there'll still be a lag. And there's the huge thermal mass of the ocean heating, keeping things warm and heating things up. So we need to do some scary stuff. We don't, we need to put money into R and D. There's a few options on the table. Basically, we're talking about solar radiation management. And this is something green groups don't like to talk about um, because it, the, I think the main reason is it could be seen as in lieu of emissions reductions or drawdown or, you know, reducing greenhouse gas concentrations. So we are very clear this is not in lieu of that. We want, we want to put money into R&D for immediate cooling um, to sort of calm down those feedback loops that are speeding up warming now. And we also want to immediately stop approval of new fossil fuels. Wind, you know, there's some other non-negotiables in there. So we'll be sharing the, the actual, um, I'll start, I'll, I'll just give you the, the, over, the overarching goal, the purpose of the Climate Rescue Accord is to set in motion that we stop global heating, maximise survival, minimise suffering and set a course to restore a safe climate so people, animals and ecosystems can flourish. So that's the overarching kind of purpose. But then there's goals that um, we'll introduce on NECNUTS uh, Wednesday, two weeks from now, um, is the climate, the sort of night of the Climate Rescue Accord. It's going to be a live stream. We're focusing just on crossbench MPs and their people and registered parties at the moment. So we're saying, you know, we're inviting execs, inviting um, inner circles, and of course the MPs themselves, we'll see who shows up, but then we'll have the recording. And Breakthrough, someone for Breakthrough, David, Splat, David Spratt, who co-wrote Climate Code Red back in 2008 with Philip Sutton, I might add, Simon, um, will present a recent, a paper that's coming out from Breakthrough on the 13th. And it's about the three R's, the reduce, redraw or, or remove and um, repair. And so that talks about those three components of climate rescue. And we'll be saying, can everyone campaign on this? Not just say, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, we agree with that, but actually campaign on it. And then what the, the working group going forward, and if anyone's interested in being on the working group, let me know. The working group will be an ongoing thing. We've set up a website, look at climaterescue.net, which is very bare bones at the moment. Um, and we'll be having work groups to unpack elements of the policy that, that the parties consider and so on. And the working group will also be monitoring what all these parties 
and MPs are doing in terms of their campaigning. Are they going to campaign on this or are they just, you know? And then we will also we want to then we want to take it global. So that's so we will be reaching out to the pirates in Europe. And um yeah, lots of there's just so much to do. So you've got your hand up, Austin. Who are the other three parties? So the ones I can say are progressives and um re uh, reason. So are you in, if you were in Victoria, you know reason. So they had a senator till very recently, uh, long-term senator, really good long-term senator. And um, there's fusion. Oh, yeah, so those, those are the three I can tell you about. And then there's another one. So. Mm. Thank you. What do you guys think of that? Sounds compelling, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, beyond net zero. Yes, beyond zero emissions, yeah. Yeah, and really needing that collaboration, working together, united front. Mm. So, so what we've been doing at the moment, like I've just finished sending out all the invites to the MPs and registered parties, the formal invites, but I'm, we've also been sort of going in, doing word of mouth, kind of getting people interested in it, saying this, this invite is going to be coming, look out for that and so on. So make sure you get all your Fusion executive to come along. Daryl saying negative emissions, extract CO2 from the air, plant trees. Yep, for sure. I keep missing that bit. Okay. All right, I'll move to the next slide. Cool. Um, thank you. So there's a fair bit of policy stuff um, to get through as I have taken up a lot of air time in the last couple of meetings. Um, so I'll rush through it. There's a few things I'll go through pretty quick if I can. Um, and we have, it won't just be me speaking, which is nice. Um, so just quickly, uh, we have put out, uh, that was in, I believe it was missing the, um, in the last newsletter, but it did go in the reminder for this meeting. Um, we do have a, uh, we have put out on the website, a, uh, position statement, just fleshing out the, uh, position that, that Fusion has on the voice referendum. So the, uh, the, the, the position, uh, the policy position has been for quite some time of, of uh, supporting the voice referendum and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, voice uh, the, from the heart, the um, statement from the heart. And we have uh, the, the statement that we've put out is somewhat of an exploration of the both the yes and no uh, campaigns and the, the arguments that they both have, uh, because it's very important to make sure that we're actually sort of engaging with this conversation in good faith and that we are uh, really kind of exploring this properly and 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 um i think there's a lot of concern i mean there's a lot of concern that a lot of the arguments um on sort of both sides don't really sort of treat each other with um with respect and there's a lot of things that sort of yeah, on the yes campaign that um don't really properly address the, the the arguments that the no side has regardless of whether or not um or, of which there are sort of multiple of of different levels of um uh, validity and um uh, yeah so the um further to that so that's yeah so that's available on the website and further to that we do have we are planning to have an event that's more specific to uh, discussing this. So we'll present that um, that statement. And we want to have a proper collaborative and more consultative um, sort of session or two uh, to, to make sure that members sort of are across this and, and um, we can we can sort of discuss this in, in full detail. So uh, that is, I believe this Friday, uh, there might be so there'll be some discussions around when that, uh, how that will be organized but there should be more information on its way about that as soon as possible. Um, so, yeah, and as so in, in the, the meantime, if you want to jump on and look at the, the, the statement that we've put out so far, uh, feel free to send any feedback by policy at fusion.org.au or via the intake form as well as is, is available to you. So, um, so, yeah, any questions on that one quickly before we move on? Yeah, and as Michael mentioned, we will be having a member consultation um, event so we can dive into it a little bit and ask further questions there as well. 
So um, this one, and bear with me, there's a few slides that um, I wasn't able to make pretty uh, or didn't have a, uh, a whole lot of time on, but or just quite simple. So this one just really quickly, um, last meeting we talked about an initiative to sort of holistically review our policy platform and to find the gaps we need to work on. Uh, the goal was set out to group our policies based on federal portfolios and ensure that we have coverage in our platform when we're meeting the gaps. Um, so I also mentioned the possibility of a software solution that might help with this. And we've made a little bit of progress with this with something that I've been working with on the side. Um, so I'll, I just wanted to show this really quickly. Um, now, this is very much a prototype and it's not styled properly. So it's not really great to look at. Um, but our policy now is in a database. And uh, so to, to help us work with it and present it in better ways. So I've just got three sort of different views here. And so the policy view is a bit of an experiment with different kinds of um, tags where you sort of like sort of filtering tags and um, there are a few different um, yeah and then the oh, might have broken something there um, and then the campaign view is effectively uh, it's reminiscent of our current website um, so it's just the sort of this, the, these sort of campaigns and then sort of campaign groups where we sort of go into more detail about our policy um, and then on more on what we were looking at before um, all of the policies are linked into uh, the different por policy portfolios. So I've made some changes recently, so this might not be quite working at the moment, but the idea is that uh, all of these portfolio policies are, yeah, it's not finding the policies at the moment, so apologies for that. Um, but these, this, this is sort of gives us an idea of the, the links um, or like which, which pol portfolios we have covered and which ones we don't. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick sort of sneak preview of that at the moment. Um, at the moment, our main priority needs to be the actual creating of more policy content, um, including the, the sort of the summary policies for those portfolios. So that's where we really, really want to focus on. But uh, I am hoping that this sort of will help that cause a little bit. And we definitely need more hands on deck. So um, for so if you if you are, are able to help uh, in any way, or if you have ideas for this kind of thing or um, or anything else, again, feel free to email us at policy at fusionparty.org.au. Um, any quick questions on that one? No, it just looks awesome. I put in a policy about how we should build the world's fastest trains um, in Australia because I'm sick of people saying we can't build trains here. Um, how, when does that get to a, does that get, what happens with that policy? Where's, where, where's, where is it in the pipeline towards being discussed and decided on? Yeah, so that's, I mean, I, I, I've seen that come through in the intake form. So that's, I mean, it's a good question. As I mentioned, there's a bunch of, there's a few things in there that we really need to start um, moving forward with and, and getting into to work streams so we can, um, so we can develop this stuff out. Um, there are some things in, in uh, as I said, I'll be showing like the, the portfolio side of things uh, where we have some, like we have some policy on transport, a lot of it's sort of sparse on detail, uh, but we really want to sort of enhance that stuff. So um, if you're, if you have the time to, or you're able to sort of look at putting some more stuff together on, on that, um, the, the portfolio, the idea of the portfolio page is that there's sort of a summary for each portfolio. So a paragraph or two that really talks about our sort of aspirational um, sort of objectives. With that stuff and it can mention policy and things like certain policies um but also um and then yeah and then the sort of the more detailed policies will go down into that now again that's more of a storage and data modeling sort of sort of experiment at the moment so there's a lot more to do with that um but yes on to your question specifically yeah that's it's um that's one of many uh areas that we really need to start putting more time into so um, especially once we get past the the housing stuff which has been a big focus we really keen to get more um uh more detail and more sort of more um content built on a on a bunch of different topics um uh so yeah angus has just mentioned in the chat uh we do have a mention of sort of high-speed rail um and so yeah there's a lot of things that we have at the moment that are uh that we, i think i think we're pretty like we've got a a pretty comprehensive or a pretty broad ranging um, policy platform, but there's a lot of missing detail. There's a lot of missing complexity and, and things like that. So um, yeah, there's always going to be more work to do. There's always going to be ways we can be better. Um, I have spent some time recently as part of that little um, prototype, looking at almost every other policy, political party's platform. Um, and 
I'm still, I, 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 there are some others that are okay. I think the Greens presentation is not too bad, but um, the the major parties are absolutely dismal. Um, they're mostly just a few bullet points and they don't really go into detail about anything or explain anything. Um, but yeah, Greens are okay. Reason has some okay um, presentation on some things, but yeah, I think we're, we're, we're pretty good, but we can be a lot better. So I'm very keen to sort of work more on the presentation of these things as well. And um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff we can do there. Cool. So, oh, Nathan just mentioned the chat Hyperloop Tech. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, one more thing. Yeah, it's something that can be looked at and considered in in all of these um of these things. So, if you got interest in that, feel free to um send the fight stuff in. And if there's multiple people who are sort of keen to work on something in particular, um, we should get you together and and um yeah, whatever you have sort of passions in or, or expertise in as well. Especially, we can get you going with uh, uh to to. To start building that out it's uh yeah again more as many hands on deck as possible as is uh is, is needed um quick another one in the chat is diffusion want to go fully pro tenant anti-landlord house price and rent reduction um that's a great question um we can i can definitely sort of more address it more in the next part so we'll be giving a bit of an update on the um on the uh next oh so in some of the next sections um definitely not sort of full one way or another it's the, a lot of what we've been trying to talk about is really respecting the complexity of the situation and i think a lot of the sort of extremes a lot of things is, is not the sort of the way we want to go so um it's uh we can talk about that a bit more um as we sort of move into the next sections unless there's any more right away um I was going to, the next part is to sort of move into the, the, the housing uh, policy, but before we do, and I don't have a slide to, to introduce this, but we had, yeah, we've had a few sessions talking about sort of housing policy and stuff. And so hopefully this is the final sort of bulky update before we're ready to present the full policy package. Uh, but yeah, firstly, uh, we have a presentation from Austin, who has been doing a deep dive into sort of the historic and global aspects that are so really important to understanding the situation of this. So um, big part of the, the problem identification steps we've done um, in the report we brought out a couple of weeks ago. And there's lots of different aspects to this. Uh, it's a complicated issue, but the really, really important one that um, Austin is going to be sort of talking about for uh, so next. So I'll uh, stop sharing here. And Austin, if you want to take it away. Now you say I've um, uh, done it, doing a deep dive on this. You could say it's very deep because I've been covering housing in one way or another since about um, 2007. Um, and in 2007, I was shocked to discover that during the, uh, when progressive hero, Tanya Plibersek was, um, sorry, I'm just having a little trouble opening this. There we go. Um, it was the progressive hero, Tanya Plibersek was the housing minister. We still saw housing, um, uh, uh, affordability go down and homelessness go up and that sort of really got me thinking about it. I was writing for a local paper at the time one of the and one of the experts said so long as the as the as the labor market keeps polarizing into winners and losers so will the housing market and that really sort of opened my mind to a lot of um different ways of thinking about this and this is sort of the culmination of years of, of following um the issue so um, I'm calling it, this presentation is called The Aussie Housing Nightmare, uh, Heterodox Macroeconomic View. Now, this is, a, the, the title is a little bit misleading because a lot of what I'm going to be discussing is not Australia specific and it's not even about housing policy. So Michael is going to update you on what Fusion's policy group has been working on, which is, you know, Australia and housing policy specific. But this is how other policy elements, other things outside the housing industry and even outside Australia are affecting um, the Australian housing experience. So a uh, big premise of my um, presentation is that it's not just about supply. In fact, Australia has quite, if you're talking, it depends how you define supply. If you define supply as listings, we have a real problem. But if you define supply as construction, we don't. So, I mean, Michael can get more into that. But if it's not about supply, what do I um, think it's about. Uh, well, sorry, in terms of supply, we've got this, this is a graph from the uh, Fusion Party's evidence review. And you see the population has actually been growing lower than that, slower, more slowly than the housing stock, while the price has been absolutely rocketing up. So that sort of shows that there's definitely something going on apart from supply here. Um, 
And the quote in a quote from page 13 of the evidence review of the housing affordability uh, policy development document is the argument that simple physical supply is the barrier to affordable housing is not substantiated as prices have grown substantially even in regions with greater supply than physical population growth needs. And there's a few, um, there's some more detail about that in that document. So if anyone wants to sort of really get into the weeds with that, they can. Um, so I, my alternative theory it fits with something you can call the everything bubble. So what the graph you see at the bottom there is house prices in Sydney. And the graph above now is the S&P, S&P 500, the, the index of the US stock market and uh, Bitcoin. And uh, what we've got here, what the next thing I'll do is I'll throw in the, um, am I, yep, the all time highs of these diff very different asset classes. Uh, Bitcoin peaked on November 10, 2021. The S&P on the 3rd of January, 2022. And Sydney house prices peaked on February 13, uh, 2022 as well, right? So um, we've got, uh, that's all within a 90 day window, all of these very different asset classes all peaked at once. And so I think what's going on is that um, you, and you can see the pattern that they take is there's, there's some similarities in the overall pattern apart from that. They've all had a bit of a, a rebound since then. Um, I'm skeptical that they'll, they'll remake those highs. We can see that, you know, um, the S and P is taking a bit of a dive after it's uh, recovery. We'll see what happens, but my base case is that it's going to go down along with, you know, these other speculative assets and I'll get into why. Um, so, and the reason I think for th that is that rates have been falling for decades. This is the RBA's cash rate and the cheaper it is to borrow money, the more money people borrow and that fuels speculation um, and pushes up asset prices, including houses. Um, and so the first rate hike of the recent cycle was in the, on the 3rd of May in, the, in 2022 and the US Fed started in March, so a couple of months earlier than that. And what you can see is that over the same period that this um, graph shows, the there was a massive increase in household debt to GDP, now reversing as rates rise. So, um, you know, we were it was less than 50% in the start of the 90s, household debt to GDP, and it's peaked at over 120% which is really remarkable. You know, the, cheap, the cheaper debt is, the more people use it. Um, and when that happens, it creates this runaway effect where because people are borrow, able to borrow more, house prices go up. So people um, view housing as a very, as a very good investment and that brings more money into the market. Same dynamic with stocks, Bitcoin, many other asset classes um, and real estate in many other countries. So um, this is all um, in nominal terms. Um, and that gives you some idea of how dramatic this long-term trend of downwards um, interest rates has been. Um, but here is the um, US data because we for in inflation adjusted interest rates. So that's simply the federal funds rate, their equivalent of the RBA's cash rate, minus the CPI uh, over the previous year. So what you what you see is that it, from uh, Eight in it was a positive eight in real terms in the nineteen at the in the early eighties, uh, and it's gotten down to um, a negative eight in real terms over the forty years ending in March twenty twenty two, which is really remarkable if you think about it. That you, you know you're borrowing a hundred dollars and you're paying back ninety two, um, and this yellow arrow points to when it went positive, which was only in April of this year. So it's only been in positive territory for a few months, and that's why I think you'll say you'll will find that the majority of the asset price falls are still ahead of us. Um, now that might sound like great news because it's sort of solving the problem for us, but there's, it's going to, it could be really ugly um, because it's going to have a broader effect across the economy. We'll talk about that a little bit um, further down. Um, but what I, uh, the, the question is, right. Why, why have interest rates, been falling so consistently for so long. I don't personally see the central bankers as the leaders of this process. I see them as following government. So it begins with wages, right? So here's the labor share of income. It's again in the late 70s, early 80s, it was uh well in it was you know well over 60%. Um in Australia it's now trending down towards 50% um and gotten has has gone below the um, OECD average. 
um, and dropped well below the US, where we, we like to think we have a, a, a you know, we're, we're to the left of them on everything. But in terms of the labor share of income, they're actually doing better than us workers in the US, right? Um, and so what happens is, as the labor share of income falls, which means ordinary people have less money to spend, that creates a deflationary pressure. And the Reserve Bank responds to that deflationary pressure by cutting interest rates. And that cutting interest rates leads you to have, you know, a $3 million house in Marrickville um, that's, you know, not a very not a very special house anyhow. So this is, so it starts with raise, wages and it ends with the housing crisis. So just to go over the steps, wages falling relative to GDP is disinflationary. Disinflationary pressures cause central banks to cut rates. Low rates increase borrowing capacity, pushing up prices and starting a speculative bubble. The rich win twice. First, they pay less in wages to, to workers, and then they gain more in asset appreciation. And the rest of us lose twice with stagnant wages and rising housing costs. So um, it's it's a really, it's a sort of, th this is the, 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 the results of neoliberalism. To, to use a bit of a, a scare word, but I think it's 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 fair to use it here. Now, um, this is like I said, it's not unique to Australia. This is data from the UK, uh, from a book called um, "Basic Income and Sovereign Money" by Jeff Crocker, um, and he is uh, the, the red line is the consumer spend, and the blue line is labour income. And as you can see, uh, around sometime in the nineties, spending overtakes wages. Now, part of that is uh, that people at the top who are, who are making profit and have passive income that's not from wages, landlords and see and you know shareholders and stuff are spending. But another, but, a, but probably a bigger part of it is debt. So you know, in the in the seventies and eighties, people sixties, seventies and eighties, people had savings. Now they have debt, and I think that fits with most people's sort of lived experience as well, right? Um, so that's that's in the UK. Again, I don't have that data for Australia, but I think you'd find a very similar pattern across the developed world. Um, and now, the, his, his, we're going to zoom out even further now um, and go back to the. This is inflation data for the OECD. Um, uh, the red line is Canada. For some reason, they've got data going back much further. Um, but you know, the, the other lines, the GT, G20, Australia, Germany, other developed economies. Um, and you can see they all kind of move pretty much together. Um, and there's a there's a few periods I think we need to sort of leave out, um, which is World War One and the immediate follow-up, World War Two and the the period when people are just getting home, and COVID. You see these inflationary spikes there, which sort of are, are outside just the normal operation of policy, right? They're kind of special cases. So, but excluding them especially, you can really see that there's a, a big trend from a deflationary crisis in the 20s and during the depression, right, um, to a the stagflation of the 70s. And then there's another big trend down from the stagflation of the 70s to the big before the pandemic, where inflation had been, you know, low for a long time, at low rates and low inflation. Um, now, that corresponds, those two periods, I think, correspond to different ways of thinking, especially about government spending and, and wages as well, but just focus on government spending for a sec. Um, one is the, the thinking proposed by John Maynard Keynes, who you see on the left, who's one of his great lines was anything we can do, we can afford, which he was in an article he or an opinion piece, I think he wrote in support of arts funding, saying that, you know, we can not afford to pay artists to do to, to, to sort of reinvigorate the economy and, and reinvigorate the cultural scene after the Second World War. Um, but now we have much more simplistic thinking. We've got, you know, the the the, the last two Australian treasurers there, and they have basically, you know, fairly simplistic thinking: surplus good, deficit bad. So what what I'm suggesting is that the Keynesian policies uh, push us out of the depression all the way up to the stagflationary peak in the 70s. Um, Keynes was dead by then; he wasn't about around to, um, to, you know, correct any policy errors or anything like that, but people were working in his basic paradigm. And then what happened in the 70s was we had stagflation, which means stagnant economic growth and um, inflation at the same time, which, which runs counter to Keynesian theory, which says, you know, inflation is the sort of friction that comes from growth. Um, and so, you know, it's more acceptable um, in the context of growth. Um, and then we, my basic premise is that we overcorrected 
right? We overcorrected and, and we were too worried about inflation. Um, and so we moved away from government spending and we moved away from policies that build wage growth. And that created this deflationary effect. I mean, and, but we didn't know we'd overcorrected because every time the economy wobbled, the, the RBA or the central bankers cut rates and increased the amount of debt in the economy and that sort of covered up the problem. Um, so just to recap, we've got the Keynesian era, which is from the depression to the 1970s. Um, and there we had the inflationary impulse was positive from wages and government spending. They were both causing inflation. And so the monetary policy had to, to be the brakes. You know, they, wages and government spending were, were the accelerator and monetary policy had to be the brakes because otherwise inflation would spiral out of control. And then in the neoliberal era from the 70s till now, wages and government spending have been disinflationary overall because they haven't kept up with productivity and GDP growth. Um, and that has created uh, let, forced monetary policy to push the other way. That's why we've had rate cut after rate cut, record low after record low. And this had all, created all kinds of problems. This low, this looser and looser um, monetary policy. We've cre created asset price bubbles, including in housing. It, it, it made productivity growth, growth quite sluggish because companies that should have gone out of business were just able to roll over their debt at ever cheaper rates and stay, keep operating without, you know, investing in technology or efficiencies or, or you know, doing anything to, to justify um, their continued existence. So, like, I like to say we got the, we got the worst of both worlds. We have the um, inequality of capitalism without the dynamism, Right. Um, it's a form of socialism for the wealthy. Um, and it also led to finance-driven monopolies like Uber. So Uber and other tech companies can lose money um, hand over fist for a long time and just, just gobble up um, market share. And in fact, they have to, because if they don't, someone else will, and they'll be pushed and they, they'll lose their market share and they'll stop existing. Um, so there, there's a lot of companies that have been using this loose monetary policy to run at a loss and eliminate the competition and establish a monopoly position. So that's another problem, uh, one of the many problems that come from this. And the big question, of course, is what comes next, right? And this is where it gets really exciting because Fusion's existing policies, Fusion's all sort of basic policy vision, um, you know, is all about economic dynamism, a basic income, for example, infrastructure, wage growth, education, high-speed rail, uh, public housing, public housing, you get a double whammy for public housing because first you actually get the houses and two, that spending um, uh, reverses the trend of of uh, deflationary headwinds, which has caused the central banks to have the ultra low rates as well. So it, it, public housing is actually even better in terms of housing affordability than it might seem. Um, and then, you know, science funding and a space program, all of these things add up to a macro environment, which will um, incidentally, as it were, uh, create an, the environment for affordable housing where asset prices fall, especially relative to incomes, or at least asset prices hold steady while incomes and the rest of the economy grow around them to catch up. So that's, that's basically my view. I see there's a lot in the chat. I, so I wasn't reading them as I went. Uh, their workers aren't doing very good either. I say that, that take it that's about Uber. Angus. That's, uh, that's, that's Qantas on the previous question of uh, Qantas oh, okay. is another example of a company undercutting their uh, competitors for monopolies. Yeah, yeah, and that's the, that's the behavior that is rewarded. And that's why you get these really aggressive people like Elon Musk succeeding, because it's all about who's going to take the most risks and who's going to, um, you know, borrow the most money and, 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 and rush to sort of gobble up the whole economy as, as, as quickly as possible. People who take a more conservative approach where they actually worry about whether the companies are profitable and and things like that get left in the dust because um you know low loose credit means uh rewards risk takers even to the point of being negative yeah that was i loved that austin it was really good just very well presented too um and and what comes next is the really exciting stuff. And I think for me, it's donut economics, like seven principles. And though that sort of underpins it all, but I think we have to think like monetary policy, and you've said it really well, is said to it's neoliberal, it's neoliberal rubbish. And and we should yeah. be using fiscal policy 
targeted fiscal policy if we actually want to control, if we actually care about controlling inflation, we would be using fiscal policy to do so because we could target exactly where we want to control inflation. Oh, look, it's, you know, the inflation is being caused by housing and by um, increased energy prices, but we're just going to, across the board, increase interest rates. You know, it's such a, a blunt tool. It's like trying pushing a string to try and affect change. That's right. I mean, I think I'm I'm actually of the opinion that interest rates were too low for too long. Mm. So I don't mind that they've come up a bit. Um, uh, but that and I think that's it's required if you want to have the fiscal space to operate without getting inflation, you're going to need higher interest rates. And it's not just using fiscal policy like taxes and, and so forth to stop inflation. It's also when, so what I, I think is going to happen and a lot of other people think is going to happen is now that they have raised rates into positive territory, all of those zombie companies are going to collapse and we're going to have a deflationary spiral on our hands by next year. And rather than react to that by cutting rates back to zero and, and, and trying to reinflate the bubble, we should be stepping in with strategic investment, you know, building yep. things, getting transferring money to households, um, you know, using using the fiscal levers rather than um, relying on the monetary levers. What we've had is instead of wage growth and instead of sufficient investment, we've had interest rate cuts. I like to say it's like if someone's in a you know if someone's being abused, they might use drugs to deal with it. It's like you know um, the, the 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 interest rate cuts are like a, a drug addict, um, you know, taking drugs rather than dealing with the underlying trauma mm, mm, mm. and dysfunction. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's some, I mean, there's some very compelling arguments uh, or sort of uh, information about um, the the way that low interest rates, or at least low as, they, as they've been, um, uh, promote uh, inequality, obviously, because the just ideally the rich getting able to get richer. Um, and yeah, Fusion's policy in a lot of places has talked about um, the idea of putting things into just more productive places and, and the idea that there's so much opportunity that we have that we're almost always squandering because uh, all the real governments, all governments have really done over the last few years is just prop up the housing market through these measures that Austin has explained rather than actually doing things that are uh, where that capital can go and really sort of work for us properly, and we can actually benefit from um, sort of fairly. Yeah, there's a lot of hypocrisy there. It doesn't really seem uh, MPs with all their investment properties are being effective representatives for us. Um, I think we need a lot more transparency of who owns what. So thanks for sharing my that. Favorite, my favourite yeah. is... Senator Nick McKim from the Greens, who's their spokesperson for economic justice. I never stop. I go on about this endlessly. He owns four houses and has four mortgages. And so he goes out there and says, I don't want, oh, he's attacking the RBA saying you can't raise rates, you can't raise rates. And it's like, well, you know, you should really sit this one out, mate, right? Like maybe put someone in, maybe get someone else to, to talk about it who doesn't have such a huge vested interest. Um, mm. But that's just a particularly extreme version. I mean, you know, all of that you're very hard pressed to find an MP who doesn't have an investment property, or at least whose partner doesn't have an investment property, right? Um, if you have a look at the register of, of, of interest, it's it's all laid out for us. Yes, I wish they had it on their Twitter as well. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the last thing I'll say is like, but what, what, you know, what Brian is saying is it's actually an exciting time because this policy is run out of road. We're not going back to that neoliberal era. I don't think that central bankers will be willing to cut so low and so savagely again after this recent bout of inflation. Um, so I think we are really at the end of the neo neoliberal era here. Um, and that's an amazing and exciting time for parties like us who actually have ideas to put forward for, you know, what comes next, rather than just, you know, retracing old debates that we were all sick of having from, you know, the last century. Just a question, Daryl, in the chat there. Does, does Fusion uh, want to have a conduct, conduct policy before getting MPs or senators elected uh, to constrain what investment classes these hopeful hypothetical people may invest in? Um, we do already have some uh, policy around sort of transparency and certain uh, things like that. So, I mean, obviously supporting um, Anti-Corruption Commission, Federal Anti-Corruption Commission, to make sure that there's more accountability there. 
Uh, but there is, there has been sort of talk and, and ideally some things in the works as well to sort of expand on some of those things as well. There's a lot of things from that perspective to, um, you yeah, know, to bring more accountability on those, on those accounts that are really, uh, really, really important. So Michael, did you want to present what's happening with the housing group, uh, the housing policy group specifically, the more um, Australia focused uh, stuff now? I've just, you know, what I'm talking about is, is, yeah. is you know, everything around this. That's the yep, content. I can do. So yeah, I've, I've got a few more slides just to, to sort of finish off with. Um, mine aren't for me anywhere near as um, well done as as um, as Austin's one. Um, but yeah, just a, a few things, just sort of updating where we're up to in the, in the policy working group. Um, they're a little bit, little bit sort of, some of them a bit a little bit information dense. Um, but uh, yeah, so the as sort of I mentioned before, the the process that the sort of the PDC developed is. The idea of trying to make sure that we understand the problem before we uh, sort of get into discussing how to fix it, make sure they're all on the same page. The second phase is to look at the outcomes, and then the third is to look at the uh, the policy solutions. So this has been a long process, and we've we've been at it for sort of a while, and we're hoping to refine it and make it more efficient. Um, but sort of as Austin has sort of demonstrated, I mean, there's there's uh, uh, like a whole lot of uh, sort of as factors that go into this housing system uh, situation. And uh, many of them are historical and systemic and complex, but we feel like we can sort of, well, sort of generalize them sometimes into two simple perspectives. And the first is just that the system is inefficient and unfair. And so a lot of the things that um, Austin sort of demonstrated just, just before is um, sort of falls into this category. Um, other well, things of just, yeah, prices are too high. The, in the incentives are sort of all wrong for um, where the housing market and in, in, in the housing market in general and um, supply is not keeping up with demand. So that is a factor as, as, um, as Austin mentioned, it's not the only factor there's, there's but, but there is, that is a factor in, in, in certain cases. Um, there are a few other sort of notes of the things like uh, regional differences. So things in inner cities are different to how things are in, in regions and between different states. And so those are things that we need to make sure that we're we're, we're considering. We're we're not just doing things for sort of inner city people or or uh, any one particular sort of uh, group of people. Um, but the other sort of perspective is that people are doing it tough today, and things really aren't getting better. And the policy options for from other parties, there are certain, there are some okay things out there, but most of what's there is just not enough. Um, and what this sort of really boils down to is, yeah, we need both sort of long-term and systemic changes. Uh, there are things that we need to do to really change the system and make it fairer. Um, but then we also need short-term relief now. So um, because the, 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 the just people that can't wait that long. Um, and so there was a, a concept I've mentioned a few times just about the idea of respecting the complexity. Um, and so uh, we do sort of recognize those two sort of main points in our policy platform. We, we have sort of a, a spread of different things, um, but there is more complexity that serves to be addressed. And it's important to understand uh, the factors that got us here, but simply reversing them isn't really enough. Um, so for example, uh, while high pr house prices are far too high, we, in certain cases, uh, we don't have enough houses being built. So the, the increase of dwellings uh, is lower than the increase in households in lots of places. Obviously, there's more nuance to that in certain cases, but um, but then in order for new house, new dwellings to be built, there needs to be an incentive to make that investment. And rental yields in Australia are generally considered quite low, partially in part two, uh, the fact that the pr house prices are so high. So if you buy a house, uh, like if you're going to spend put a, that, a certain amount of money into uh, an investment, you're going to want a certain return. And if you're going to be putting 1.5 million in, and you're going to get only going to be getting um, the little bits of rent that that come through, compared to other uh, compared to the the, the returns that sort of capital gains gives and things is is it's it's pretty much it's uh, uh, very very different. And so, um, if we were to remove or reverse that capital growth we are almost going to remove that incentive to invest in rentals and that growth in supply that we need uh, will be all but impossible under that current paradigm. So this needs to change. It's not something we can just leave. Um, we need to make it so that it is a sound investment to provide affordable housing and adequate housing 
Um, and it needs to be because it provides real value uh, and that value is housing rather than the sort of purely speculative nonsense of the current status quo. Um, we also can't take lightly sort of just the scale of economic shift we're asking for here. Um, housing makes up a massive percentage of household wealth. So like 51%, in which uh, when you include both uh, owner occupiers uh, and uh, sort of investments. So um, we need more productive places for that wealth to go. Uh, there's, as we've met, as I mentioned, there's all these other opportunities we could be we could be doing. So, but there's a lot of things that don't quite exist in a way that sort of they need to. And so, also as Austin mentioned, the the there's a the scope of this sort of policy or this this approach. It is a very big economic change, uh, and it does span lots of things. So, even even if we were to we uh, as we're bringing out this housing policy. Um, there will be more to do, and uh, it really does touch on every aspect of, of our economy. Well, as I mentioned before, there's the outcomes thing, so the side of things. So um, uh, just sort of yeah, given all this complexity, our process brings us to the outcomes, and there's a broad range of outcomes that the group has determined is vital. Uh, these are our sort of broad aspirational goals that should underpin the policy solutions. So Ideally, regardless of whether or not house prices are high or low relative to wages, uh, just people, nobody should be in housing stress, there should be a stronger safety net, and rental markets should be sort of strong as well in order to provide housing and uh, not, not, to, not to provide sort of big investments, to, but to actually provide housing to, to renters and, and the movement, uh, allow people to move freely between houses and, and change when they need to. Um, but yeah, that comes along with strong rental rights. And also uh, better zoning and planning so we can have better uh, environments, um, less urban sprawl, and yeah, minimum standards and uh, sort of yeah, a more equitable taxation system. Sort of, so we're making sure that we're doing these things productively. And then finally, this one is uh, a bit of a bit of a information dump, but um, Sort of this is a yeah this is a slide I sort of uh, I won't linger on this one too much because we'll continue this as part of the the working group after this meeting but uh, recognizing that there's a lot of policies outside of sort of the housing package we need to address um, we also have sort of obviously we have the basic income and investment in science infrastructure as Austin mentioned um, and that driving that economic dynamism to is, is sort of a key part of uh, where we need to be sort of doing these it sort of underpins those outcomes as well in these policies. Uh, but this is just a bit of a summary on the additional policies we're looking to bring, bring to the bring to the platform. And so there's various uh, current policies uh, here that we'll be looking to revise of the, the existing platform. And there's a number of ones of other sort of policy ideas that we're we're here. Um, yeah, so I won't go through them all in detail, but they both range from some immediate things like the expansion of the CRA. Um, for that sort of immediate support and help to those people who need it. And also some, uh, some ideas of, of, of how we can really change the, uh, the, the incentives so that we can uh, make sure that we don't, we're not just absolutely trashing the economy by uh, making these broad uh, and long-term changes. So that was a bit of a rant from me at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, if there's any other questions, we're sort of at 802. So um, if there's any other quick questions we can go to and then I'll, I'll pass back to Saha to close us off. This is more of a comment than a question. I just, well, I, I just, I don't mean to be difficult, but I can't help but raise an issue with the idea that household wealth is, in, is increased by housing. Because unless you own an IP, you can't realize that wealth. It's not real, right? Because the only way you could get it is sell your house and then you need to go buy another house. And it's all the houses have gone up in value. So having expensive houses makes us poorer as a nation. It doesn't make us richer as a nation. The only people who are able to cash in on that are those with investment properties. Um, and as you say, Michael, um, a lot of those people are actually losing money on the rental because the mortgage is so high. So it only makes sense as long as the asset price is their equity gains are making up for that that sort of cash flow loss. So I think it's a it's a really it's a really nasty situation. Um, but I'm and I'm going to uh, quote this guy Hyman Minsky. He says the damage in a speculative speculative bubble is done on the way up. It's not done on the way down.
when prices return to when prices come back to reality right um and so the the i i think that what we should be talking about if we're talking about protecting um homeowners um and people with with huge mortgages which may not be which may represent having overpaid is we should be talking about debt forgiveness um when the house prices fall um and then we have to be careful as well so that we're not rewarding sort of reckless speculative investment we're just protecting households that um have sort of been had so you'd have to have make it make it very you know means tested and targeted so you're not um you know creating perverse incentives um but yeah that's that's all I, I just question how real the wealth is that people think they have when their house is worth a lot if you don't yeah, sell I mean I, I I certainly um don't disagree with any of that I mean that's the 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 concept that the, the um the, that that number of that wealth that's I mean I, either way that that wealth is is it's sort of yeah it's it's the it's considered there right it's I mean it's not in sorry it's not sitting in cash um and yeah the 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 main idea there is that um if nothing else changes and the house all the house prices go down that does have real effects on sort of on on those on the people that have that um it's not just they just completely lose that money but the main point is to that we're uh, factoring in the various negative thing, uh, outcomes from from that, and the main point I I, I, I thought was most important is is the uh, that that wealth if, if money's going to come out of housing it needs to go somewhere better it needs to go somewhere um, that sort of fuels our economy and and and, and makes uh, it goes to things that are more productive. Um, the idea of the the last... these, things, these things being just spe really speculative when it comes to housing is is. One of, usually being one of the main uh, problems that I've had. Uh, yeah. At the last housing meeting, I remember someone floating a, a, an idea of, you know, allowing, you know, mom and pop investors, so to speak, to invest in public housing. So I know the way I put it is it's like war bonds, but it's a war on homelessness. Um, I don't, and I think that that was a really interesting idea. Um, that is, is it, and it's, you, you actually suck money out of, the private um the speculative housing market and by sucking it into these you know public housing bonds or, or or whatever it is which pay some kind of dividend um and are used to fund you know massive public housing expansion i don't remember whose idea it was but it, it, it struck me as really clever the, the returns wouldn't be very good so there's there's now the idea of the institutional investors in build to rent so and that's what the, the u.s a lot of rental, cheap rental, affordable rental housing, it's based on low-income housing tax credits. So there was a bit of government subsidy in there in terms of the tax credit, and that would be affordable for 10 or 15 years. Um, and then it would might get more tax credit to, to rent or what. But then you just got these masses of flats that were owned by one institution and they held on to them because it, you know, it brought in some income. It's when you have the mum and dad investors that 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 want to, you know, oh, this is my now I need to sell it. Now I need to, you know, you need institutional investors that want to hold on to it because the returns aren't that great at the moment. It probably needs some government subsidy on top of that. Really amazing. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Michael, for sharing the details of that. Very robust informative discussion so you guys have to continue on after this so let's wrap it up i'm really glad to see some new faces tonight and to share your interests and your comments as well so um please if you want to get further involved or just ask a question um make sure you email to exec at fusion that's the best way to to get the majority of us um yeah so i'd love to see more of you contributing to policy in future